Thank you. We are experiencing an explosion in data about humans that is unprecedented in scale, all the way from our own DNA to global social networks. We are experiencing data that we've never seen before. And as we learn to capture and make sense of this data, we are entering into an era of change that I think will be as profound as the Industrial Revolution. It's in this context that I want to tell you about two efforts I've been involved in, one very personal in nature, involving my family, and one very public. Pictured here is my son, and this first story, which involves both my wife, who is a professor of speech and hearing sciences, Rupal Patel, and I, decided to make a study of how my son learned his first words in a completely new way. Welcome to my home in Boston. If you come into my house and you look in the living room and you look up, you will see a camera and a microphone embedded in the ceiling. And when you look down from this camera, you get a bird's eye view of the living room. There's my wife and my son when he was about three months old. And as we look through other parts of the house, through different cameras, the baby bedroom, the living room, the kitchen, and the rest of the house, these cameras and microphones are connected to a massive disk array that was placed in the basement of the house. We're flying through now a day in the life of our house, about 10 hours, blue light of daylight, and as we go through the, the activities of a typical day at home, it goes to incandescent orange light and finally lights out for the evening. Over the course of almost three years, we collected what must be the world's most elaborate and complete home video collection. So you're looking at here part of a disk array at MIT where we house almost a quarter million hours of multi-track audio and video data. We took a lot of effort to, to understand the privacy issues and to have this data stored in a way that we could analyze language and how my son learned his first words while preserving privacy uh, of our family. So what I'd like to do now is take you for a tour through this one-of-a-kind data set and show you some of the ways that we started to analyze and make sense of raw data and pull out of it patterns and ultimately some new insights into how one child learned his first words. This is a video clip of my wife and I in the kitchen, we're looking down, preparing breakfast. We have almost 100,000 hours of video like this. So the question is, how do you find data that matters? What you're seeing here is a visualization in which we track movement patterns. You'll see my wife and I, we're moving through the kitchen. And as we're moving through space and through time, there I am carrying some plates. We're leaving behind what we call space-time worms, a kind of visual language that we can extract from video. And this became a very useful way for us, without watching video, to find where people are. And we developed a software system where we could look, in this case, at two minutes of activity in the home through three rooms. Or we could pull back with our mouse and look at an entire day or even three months. And with this visualization method, we could track my son's location throughout the home and then transcribe everything he heard and said over the period of two and a half years. And that brings us to our first stop in the data tour, where I will play for you now what we call the birth of a word. When my son was about a year old, he started to use this, the sound gaga to mean water. And then over six months, he slowly developed the full English form, water. What you will hear is the equivalent of a time-lapse video of a flower blossoming. We will fly through six months of my son's development in about 40 seconds. So listen as we go from gaga to water.
pretty cool, isn't it? So my son, thank you, thank my son. <laughs> he didn't just learn the word water. In fact, he learned well over 500 words by the time he was two years old. This seems like a very high number of words, but in fact, no one has had the data to trace every single word. You're looking here at what we call a map of all the word births, month by month, day by day, moment by moment, every time a new word entered his vocabulary, we know where and when it happened. And this gives us a framework to do a kind of scientific analysis. What was the impact of the environment on the order in which he learned words? Shown here as a baseline is a study we did where we asked the question, does hearing a word more often lead to a word being learned earlier? So if I hear ball a lot, I'm going to say it earlier. If I don't hear it very often, I'll learn it later. And in fact, we find a prediction, a uh, correlation, 0.05, a weak correlation that shows, indeed, frequency matters. But what we're really after is to understand social context. The great Jerome Bruner, a theorist of language development, believed that the activity context of everyday life within which words are heard is probably really the predictor that lets us understand how language comes about, that activity contexts provide the meaningful context within which a child can crack the code of language. And now we were in a position to put this idea into contact with data. You're looking now at me and my son in the living room. And as we fly through time, I'm leaving behind green ink, and my son is leaving behind red ink. As we play on the floor, and now we move to the couch and we look at cars, and then my son is in a walking toy playing by himself. We stop the action, and now we let time be represented along the vertical axis, and our movement patterns can be revealed in this sort of visual form. And we see these knots of green and red together. These are social hotspots. There's where we were on the couch. That spiral is where my son was by himself. And so we have this way to convert raw data into a kind of structure of social interaction. And now we can put all the pieces together. We can take millions of words of transcribed speech and look at how they intersect with what we were doing at home. So here is another video clip. Our nanny is about to offer my son some water. We're tracking everyone's movement. My son, again, in red ink. Our nanny in water. As she, offer, as she offers water, we tag that moment in space and time, and we keep a little trail of the activity around where my son heard the water. And now, the power of big data, we repeat this analysis over and over. Every time my son heard the word water over a two-year period, we trace back what was happening in the home. We interpenetrate language with context. And what is revealed in the wake of this data analysis is a landscape of all the times my son heard the word water, a kind of wordscape for the word water. And you see a lot of activity in what turns out to be the kitchen, that peak in the distance, is a reading chair where my son would often drink water before bedtime. And so it captures, in a sense, the experience of a lifetime as the word water is heard. Let's fly over to another part of the house. This is the entrance of the house, where people come and go as they enter and leave the house. And if we compare the landscape for the word by, as in goodbye, as expected, we see much more mass near the entrance of the house. So now we are in a position to do the following experiment. Find the landscape, the wordscape, for every word my son ever learned in that period, and make the prediction that words that are heard in unique contexts, where the wordscape looks very different from all other wordscapes, that those words will be learned earlier in life. And here's the results. We go back to our frequency-based prediction of 0.05. We bring in social context. This is a completely new result based on Matthew Miller's thesis work. And we find a dramatic shift in our ability to predict. What this means is that it opens up a whole new set of possibilities for understanding how we can help children who are having trouble learning language 
by manipulating and structuring not what they hear, but the activities within which they hear words. This is, as far as we know, the, the most powerful predictive model of one child's language acquisition that's been created, and it's really because of the power of data. So a funny thing happened as we were doing this research at MIT. One of my PhD students, Michael Fleischman, decided to take the same ideas of linking words to context and take the, all the technology, which is essentially a microscope for studying what's happening in our home, and turn it into the public sphere of media. And it's a, we're making a very big switch, but it's the same ideas we're going to put to work. It turns out, in the public sphere, people are talking about TV through social media. They're talking about what they're watching, whether it's to tell their friends they're watching a show called Glee, a mindless little comment about some late night television, some more substantial comment about a presidential candidate as he debates his opponents, and sometimes even making comments about advertising. We've been tracking the volume of growth of conversations on Twitter and Facebook and the blogosphere about TV. These are three shows in US uh, reality TV genre, triple digit growth. Comedy, triple digit growth. Dramas, it's happening across the board. There's a sweeping change in how people are watching television because they're talking back. What's happening is that the social web is allowing all these conversations to persist and to spread, and we see a possibility to harness this data and fundamentally transform television from a one-way communication medium to a closed loop. So here's how we think about it. Television content drives impressions on audiences, and the more people a television program reaches, the more it's worth to advertisers. But what's always been true about television since it came on the scene is that people talk about what's on TV. They generate social expressions, and those expressions spread. What if you could build a machine that watched all of television, that listened to all public conversations, and just like the analysis in my home, linked the context of television to the talk on social media? Well, that's what we've done. We actually created a company called Bluefin Labs that grew out of the research, and this is the data visualization out of that work. This is a, net, a, a, a subset of our network of 50,000 people, a social network. And we operate satellite dishes and have machines watch TV and create a network of data where every node you're seeing here is real data is a show or a commercial on US television. We track all of the connections between content, so we end up with two graphs, a social graph and a content graph of television. And then the key piece. Using artificial intelligence algorithms, we connect the dots. Every time a person in the social graph makes a comment about something in the television graph, we draw a line. A link is formed between the social graph and the content graph. We call this the TV genome. It is the most comprehensive data set we know of that links audiences to television. 20 million people today in the United States are watching and talking. We're indexing a couple of hundred thousand shows per month and adding about 40 million links per month, more and more completely stitching together these two realms of data. So let's take a tour through this data and see what it can tell us now about a very different kind of communication dynamic. We're looking here at time along the horizon versus several major US networks. We can plot, in contrast to how many people are watching TV, how many people are talking. Each bar in this bar graph is one show on TV. The height of the bar is the number of people who talked about it. We can do this at scale. Over 200 of the biggest networks in the US now being analyzed around the clock. But we can do more than measure the number, so pick any show. Here's a show on TV. We know how many people talked, but we also know what they said. This turns out to be over 100,000 people's responses to the second US Republican presidential debate that happened earlier this fall. We can see which of the candidates are generating the most positive and negative conversation, a kind of instant feedback for the candidates. We can look over time at the volume of conversation 
one debate at a time. If you trace the light green, you see a very unusual ascent. This is Herman Cain, a candidate that was literally unknown September 12th, and in real time in our data, we see the ascent of this new candidate in the race. What works for US content works elsewhere. We can take this same idea of analyzing the, the, the connections between mass media and social media for the Egyptian revolution. And here, we slice the first couple of days that led eventually to the overthrow of Mubarak. And in Facebook and Twitter, we see the violence on the streets, the call for med medical support is dominating the conversations on the street. Meanwhile, the official voice of Al Jazeera is talking about criminals and fighters and expression. And as we slice through time, a couple of days at a time, we see an evolution in the conversation. And by the end of this period of 18 days, on the streets, congratulations in the overthrow and the mainstream press converging on the story of democracy. Imagine if the loop was closed in real time between Al Jazeera and what was happening on the street, how different the news coverage might have been. Final slice of this that can't be ignored is what makes television actually run, the business side. And if the business side is impacted, then we can predict quite securely that there is a sea change coming in our world of media. So here's another show popular in the United States called Criminal Minds. And what we can do automatically is analyze the emotional content of the audience as they're watching the show. One of the dimensions here, polite versus vulgar, very important to advertisers. As people talk about criminal mind, they're not very vulgar. They're pretty polite. In comparison, when they watch a show called Wipeout, another show I won't bother describing to you today, they're very vulgar. If you're trying to sell baby products, versus trying to build a brand for young men, you may care about this kind of audience insight, which has never been available before, because it's real time, it's in context, as people are reacting to the media. We can go and look at, in a sense, the DNA of an audience of any show on TV. The Daily Show, a news comedy crossover show, one of my personal favorites. What on television are the people that are watching and talking about The Daily Show, also watching and talking about. It turns out we can slice the TV genome and reveal a long list of shows, such as Face the Nation, or Meet the Press, or a spin-off from The Daily Show, The Colbert Report. These are all shows that rank very high in overlap engaged audiences. Why does this matter? If you want to promote The Daily Show and draw a bigger audience, and drive word of mouth with your advertising, we know of no better way to target audiences on television than this data. So the commercial implications here, one last example, if you want to reach parents, it turns out these are the top rated shows on television that, that parents talk about. And you can go and slice the, the genome in a completely different way and reach where video game players are on TV. What about Diet Coke drinkers? If you're Pepsi, I think you might want to know where fans of Diet Coke can be found in high concentrations on television. So I hope you get the idea that this new world in which the audience is talking back will commercially, I believe, transform the landscape. So in closing, let me come back to our image of the TV genome. And as I look at this image, I, I wonder if the great media theorist Marshall McLuhan were alive today, what would he say as we started illuminating completely new social structures that are emerging? I'll show you three to end. Here is one where a piece of television content drives one person to tweet. And as we track all of the people who are following this person and what they are tweeting about, we find a very interesting structure, a group of people connected to each other, all talking about the same piece of programming. What you're looking at is a group of people physically apart, but watching TV together. A virtual living room that could not have existed until these two technology layers met. We're finding thousands of these virtual living rooms in the TV genome. Here's a second structure. This is focused on an individual. 
Lots of people listen to what he says, and he talks a lot about TV. This is essentially a media critic, but nobody's paying him. But he's having huge influence in shaping how people perceive and interpret what they're watching and deciding what they watch. If you spend money on television, you need to know who that person is. And finally, sometimes it's not the person, but it's a specific piece of content. Mass media matters as much today as, as it has in the past. President Obama making his State of the Union address to, to, the, to the nation earlier this year. And at scale, for this group of people, we literally see a nation explode into real-time conversation in response to the president. So imagine a future where the elected ele officials know that the audience is not just listening, but they can be heard in real time. And the audience expects and demands their leaders to enter into conversations and not simply provide scripted uh, uh, talking points. That's the kind of power shift I think we are seeing the beginning of. And in politics, in business, in advertising, in entertainment, in news, and sweeping all the way to the foundations of communication in how children learn their first words, I think it's safe to say that we are entering a profound new era that may aptly be called the data revolution. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. What a story. Thank you. Gracias. Just one question. Yes. Y ahí está nuestro amigo Eduard Punsetti y todos. Qué gusto ahorita con la luz saludar a tanta gente, tan querida a todos los ideastas. At the end, the conclusion is language is instinct and environment. Absolutely. I, I think that there's no doubt that there is a genetic important component to language. Uh, why is it no other species can learn? I think that language is perhaps the defining feature of the human species. And yet, I think nobody doubts that without environment you don't get language, you grow up in Japan, and, uh, you learn Japanese. And very quickly, and, yes. why did you choose the word water? Oh, it was just one of these words where as we watched our son grow, we knew gaga, what it meant early on. Okay. And it was uh, just, it, it was a word that had meaning and that we knew would be in the data and so we targeted first. Gaga, thank you very much. Thank you. It's my pleasure. <laughs> gracias, muchas gracias.